Welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy. I'm Brenda Wood. The abomination of desolation is a subject that very few people understand. This is a prophecy that Jesus personally called by name. He mentioned it in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 15. When ye shall therefore see the abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. If you're uncertain as to what's meant by this mysterious phrase, the abomination of desolation, you'll be grateful you listened to tonight's topic. Perhaps you don't understand the meaning of standing in the holy place. Listen carefully and you will understand. If you're unfamiliar with the New Testament book of Hebrews or don't really understand it, tonight's presentation is perfect for your needs. I pray the Holy Spirit will open our minds and give us understanding as we explore the beautiful truths of God's holy word tonight. Let's join Pastor Kenneth Cox now as he presents his topic for the evening, The Abomination of Desolation. Our subject this evening is The Abomination of Desolation. And I'd like for you to look at Matthew, the 24th chapter, and verse 15 with me, where Christ is speaking particularly about this prophecy. Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, here he speaks of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. And tonight, we're just going to go right to the book of Daniel. We're going to begin to look at this abomination of desolation spoken of by Christ here. And this is what it says in Daniel, the eighth chapter, in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after that one that appeared to me at the first time. So he's just saying that he has had a vision here, and in the next verse he tells us where he's at at the time of the vision. I saw in the vision, and it, was so, and it so happened while I was looking, that I saw that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the providence of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Uli. So he's telling us where he's at. He was at Shushan by the river Uli. And now he begins to tell us what he is seeing in this vision. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. The two horns were high but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. So it says clearly that he sees this ram. This ram has two horns. One horn is higher than the other, and he tells us what this ram begins to do. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no beast could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver him from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Now, the scripture doesn't leave us in one bit of doubt, folks, as to who that ram is. Because if you take your Bible and you turn over to Daniel, the eighth chapter, and verse 20, it'll say very clearly here, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Medea and Persia. So it doesn't leave us in any doubt that this ram represented the kingdom of Medea, Persia. The two horns on that ram represented those two kingdoms and since the Persians were stronger than the Medes that's why it says that one of those horns came up last and it was bigger than the other because the Persians were stronger and they actually came up last some people have a little trouble here but if because in your history book it talks about the Persian kingdom doesn't say much about the Medes but it was a coalition it was two powers that had come together now as Daniel continues to watch something else begins to develop. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the first surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So as he's watching, all of a sudden, this goat begins to move across the ground, and it's moving with such speed that it says it doesn't even touch the ground. It continues to tell us about the goat. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. 
So it says that these two animals, this ram and this he-goat, are about to collide. And again, the Scripture doesn't leave us in one bit of doubt as to who this he-goat is because in Daniel the 8th chapter and verse 21, it says that the male goat or the rough goat is the kingdom of Greece and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. It says that very clearly. So we find that it talks about this ram and this goat, the ram representing me to Persia, the goat representing Greece. Now listen as the scripture begins to develop it farther on, and it says this, And I saw him confronting the ram, the he-goat, confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and tramped upon him. And there was none, no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. So it says that this he goat knocked the ram down, actually stomped the life out of him and broke his two horns. And as you read history, it makes it very clear that this he goat represented the kingdom of Greece. The great horn that is between his eyes was Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great faced the Medes and Persians, Darius and the Medes and Persians. Darius had one million men on the plains of Arbela. Alexander the Great stood there with 20,000, implemented a new type of warfare, and overthrew Darius of the Medes and Persians. So that's why it says that the ram's two horns were broken and that he stamped upon him. But listen very carefully because the scripture continues step by step to tell us exactly what's taking place here. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. Alexander took his army. They marched for seven years without ever going home. Took everything that he could lay his hands on. History even says that he wept because there was nothing else to conquer. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven. So it says at the very height of his power, that great horn was broken, and in place of it came up four horns. Alexander the Great had marched his army to the borders of India when his men refused to go any farther, said they were going to go back home. Tariq and his army, they turned around and headed back home. Alexander the Great now is suffering from malaria. He's suffering from epilepsy. He also suffering from drunkenness. One night in a drunken debauch, he realized that he had overdone it and was dying. And as he lay there on his bed, his four generals came in, and they asked him, who are you going to give the kingdom to? He said, I'll give my kingdom to the strongest. And so when he died, his kingdom was fractured, but it wound up in the hands of his four generals, were, which were Sitziander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. That's why the scripture says that that great horn was broken and in place of that great horn came up four, representing those four generals. Now watch very carefully because God with great, great accuracy describes exactly what's going to happen. Dear friend, if I can get only one thing across to you, and that is that you can depend on this book, I'll assure you that when this book makes a statement, you can depend on it. It'll happen. You and I don't have to worry. It's going to take place as God said it would, and we need to come to the place in our experience where we can rest in the fact it's there. Need to be like the little old lady the preacher went to visit, picked up her Bible and was thumbing through it, and every once in a while he'd find a scripture and beside it have the letter T and P beside the text. He kept some thumbing through there, and he noticed his all the way through the Bible. And finally he asked the lady, he said, what's these letters T and P mean here? She said, it means tried and proven. And that's true. 
you can rest assured it will happen as God said it would. Those kingdom was divided among his four generals. Now listen as God continues to tell you ahead of time, before it ever happens, he's going to tell you what's going to happen here. And out of one of them, out of one of those four horns, out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. Said out of one of those four horns came forth a little horn which became very great. History tells you that one of those generals, Seleucus, began to give nurture to treason, began to nurture a whole idea of taking over, and he began to work against those other four generals, and you find another power beginning to come to play here, and we find in history the very seed or root of the Roman Empire. It begins to come up, begins to grow, and it said, out of one of them came forth a little horn, and that little horn was that of pagan Rome. And it says that it would go towards the south, to the east, and towards the glorious land, or referring to Palestine, and Rome did just that. Now listen very carefully as the Scripture describes this little horn. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars of the ground and tramped on them, this little horn. He even exalted himself as high as the what? Prince of the host. When it says he exalted himself as high as the prince of host, that prince of host referred to there is none other than Jesus Christ. And it was under the Roman Empire that Jesus Christ was tried, that he was crucified. All right, listen carefully. And by him the daily sacrifice were taken away. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. So it says that this power would take away the daily sacrifice, that the sanctuary would be cast down. And he continues on and says, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So it says that this little horn would magnify himself against the prince of the host, he would do away with the daily sacrifice, that he would take the truth and cast it to the ground, that the sanctuary would be cast down. And it says that as Daniel is having this vision, he hears two people talking and they say this, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will be the vision? How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice, listen carefully, and the transgression of desolation or the abomination of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? said, how long is this going to go on? How long is this going to take place? And he gets an answer in verse 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, friends, tonight, I don't start to have time to go into that 14th verse unless you want to stay for three hours. Just no way. I'm not going to endeavor to go into that 14th verse. I'm going to look at that 14th verse tomorrow night, okay? This prophecy made here in Daniel 8, 14, just let me tell you right now, this is the most marvelous prophecy in all of Scripture. No agnostic, infidel, or atheist has ever been able to answer that text. If you got a friend that doesn't believe in the Word of God, bring him tomorrow night. Because this text told hundreds and hundreds of years. Before it ever happened, it told the exact year that Jesus Christ would die on Calvary. No atheist, no agnostic, no infidel has ever been able to answer that prophecy. One of the most marvelous prophecies there is in Scripture. It said unto 2,000, 
300 days, then would the sanctuary be cleansed. But there are certain things tonight that you and I have to understand before we can understand tomorrow night's subject. What we've got to get clear is we've got to understand what he meant when he said the daily sacrifice would be taken away. What's he talking about? What's he mean when he says the daily sacrifice would be taken away? Also, he said that the sanctuary was cast down. What does he mean? The sanctuary was cast down. What's he talking about when he said the truth would be cast to the ground? Those are things that we need to have clear in our mind before we can put it all together before we can really understand the abomination of desolation. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to establish those things. We found out who the ram was. We found out who the he-goat was. We found out who this little horn was, but it says this little horn would do certain things. So tonight, we're going to look at some things and establish certain things. You see, when God told Moses come up into the top of Mount Sinai. And Moses went up there, and God communicated with him and talked with him. He gave him instructions about something called the sanctuary. And he said, particularly to the children of Israel and to Moses, here in Exodus 25, verse 8, he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? dwell among them, and God gave Moses all the detailed instructions as to exactly how that sanctuary was to be built. It was to set in the middle of the camp of Israel. The tribes of Israel were to camp around it, three tribes on each side. This was where God was to dwell with the children of Israel. This sanctuary had a court. This part was known as the court here. This was the tabernacle. And we're going to take a few minutes to look at the, sa the sanctuary, look at the furniture, see what's involved in the sanctuary. To begin with, as I said, out here was what was known as the court. The tabernacle or the sanctuary had two compartments. The first compartment, this compartment here, was called the holy place. Did that ring a bell? That ring a bell? Now, you're thinking, aren't you? Huh? You know, I had a professor in school that told me it wasn't harmful nor fatal to think. Okay? So I hope that you're turning the wheels a little bit. Jesus said... When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the what? Okay, put it together. This was called the holy place. This other compartment of the tabernacle over here was called the most holy place. This was the tabernacle. Now let's quickly take a look at the furniture. Because if you would go to the tabernacle and you were to walk inside the court here, you would basically find two pieces of furniture. One, you would find what was known as the laver. This was a bowl, a large bowl that held water, and this is where the priest washed their hands and their feet because they dealt with a blood sacrifice. Also in the court was what was known as the altar of sacrifice. This is where the children of Israel came. They brought the lamb. The priest took the lamb, and after it had been slain, it was placed on the altar of sacrifice and burnt. That was the altar of sacrifice. Those two pieces of furniture out in the court. Now, let's take a quick look at the tabernacle. If you'd go to the tabernacle, walk inside the court, and go through the front opening of the tabernacle or the sanctuary, as you walked inside, one of the things that would greet you directly in front of you, just a little bit off to the left, would be the altar of incense. This is where the priests came, sprinkled the incense, but they also sprinkled the blood 
of the lamb. In fact, the scripture says they placed the blood on the horns of the altar. The horns of the altar were the corners of the altar. That's where they placed the blood as they confessed the person's sin. Also, on the other side, as you came in on the left-hand side, was the seven golden candlesticks. These candlesticks burned all the time. They gave light to the holy place, but it also represented the presence of God. And on your right, as you came in, was the table of showbread. On the table was actually 12 cakes of bread, one cake for each one of the tribes of Israel. The priests were free to eat of this. They could eat the showbread. But it was there. Had strong symbolic meaning. This was what was inside the holy place. All right. Let's say tonight that you lived back then. Let's say that you've done something wrong. Let's say you've committed a sin and you're coming to have your sins forgiven. The scripture says that you were to bring a lamb. It's what you were to bring. You were to bring a lamb. You were to bring it inside the court. And when you brought it inside the court, the scripture says that you were to take and place your hands on the head of that lamb and confess your sins. There were certain restrictions about this lamb that you were to bring. Do you know what it was? That lamb was to be without spot, out blemish. Why? Represented Jesus Christ. Yeah. They were to bring the lamb. If they could not afford a lamb, they could bring a turtle dove but they were to place their hands upon that animal and confess their sins. After they had confessed their sins on the head of the lamb, then the priest gave them a knife and they took the life of the lamb, cut its throat. Folks, get it clear. It's not very pretty, but get it clear. There is no such thing there is no such thing as your sins being forgiven without the shedding of blood. It took the blood of Jesus Christ. It was required. That lamb typified the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore it required its life, its blood. Cut its throat. The priest caught the blood in a basin. Now he's going to take that blood, he's going to part the opening veil and walk inside the holy place, and he's going to sprinkle that blood on the altar of incense, put it on the horns of the altar, and confess that person's sin. This went on every day, this is how people receive the forgiveness of their sins. Now, what I want to tell you tonight is this service that I have just described to you in every detail, in every point, it pointed forward to Jesus Christ. Every piece of furniture, every service of the sanctuary service, in every detail that pointed to the day when the Messiah would come, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was here on earth and he said so many things to those Jewish people, that certainly shouldn't have, should have done something for them. When he said, I am the light of the world, oh, they knew about the seven golden candlesticks there in the sanctuary service. They should have understood that it was referring to him, especially when he said, I am the bread that cometh down from heaven. They should have put that all together. For hundreds of years, that sanctuary service had typified the Lord Jesus Christ. And those people, too blind to see it. Too blind to see it. And what worries me is we've got the whole New Testament and maybe we're too blind. It tells us all about what he's done 
It was there, dear friends. Please, let me make something clear. I run on to some of these preachers, and I can tell you it bothers my soul when I hear some preacher trying to tell people that people in the Old Testament were saved by law. Never, 10,000 times no. People were saved by grace in the Old Testament just like people are saved by grace today. Never has been any other way. It will never be any other way. Only by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only difference is those people look forward in faith to the day that he would come and die. You and I look back in faith. That's the difference. This service is the way people receive the forgiveness of their sins. But it said that this power that we're talking about tonight, that it would do away with the daily sacrifice. Now, let me say a word to you about the daily sacrifice. Let's say that you lived off in Judah somewhere, Israel somewhere. Now, Israel's not a very big country. You know that. In fact, if you're in a jet plane, it takes you three minutes to fly across Israel the short way and 15 minutes the long way. So that'll tell you how big it is. It's not very big. But nevertheless, you could be 100 miles from Jerusalem, and in that day, that would have been a long walk. So you couldn't get to the tabernacle. So every morning and every evening, the priest took a lamb and offered that lamb. And as that lamb was being offered at a set time, you could turn towards the sanctuary in Jerusalem and confess your sins and receive forgiveness. This was known as the daily sacrifice. That's the way you receive the forgiveness of your sins. Okay, I want to talk about one other service tonight with you because it said in Daniel 8 and verse 14, it said very clearly, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now that phrase, the cleansing of the sanctuary, also was known in Scripture as the Day of Atonement. It also was referred to by the Jewish people as the Day of Judgment. It was a very, very special day, and I want you to remember talked about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, let's look at this. On this particular day, this day, the high priest, not just any priest, the high priest is going to walk through the holy place. He's going to part these curtains and walk into the most holy place, into the presence of God, where the Shekinah glory of God dwells. So when that priest gets up that morning, he puts on special clothing that he only wears on that day. On his robe are the seven stones that represent one for each tribe. There's also the Urim and the Thummim. They're there. He has a special robe on, and that robe is special because if that priest parts the veil of the most holy place and walks into the presence of God with one sin in his life, he's struck dead. So around the hem, around the base of this particular garment that he's wearing, is sewed a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all the way around that robe so that as that priest walks, the people can hear those bells, and as long as they can hear the bells, they know he's alive. That morning, he goes out and he takes a ox, actually a heifer, and he offers sacrifices that animal for his sins. He confesses his sins and the sins of Israel. This is how he is to become clean, to go into the presence of God. I hope you learn something, folks. 
I run on some people that seem to think that you get clean by beating your back or crawling on your knees. You don't get clean that way, dear friend. It says that if we confess our sins, He, Jesus Christ, is faithful and just to what? Forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the way you get clean. That's the way the priest got clean. He went there and he offered that animal for his sins, representing Jesus Christ. Now, they take two goats. They cast lots for these goats. One becomes known as the Lord's goat. The other becomes known as the scapegoat. The Lord's goat is now taken by the high priest and sacrificed. He catches the blood in the basin. The high priest now is going to walk through the holy place. He's going to part the veil and walk into the most holy place, into the presence of God. The most holy place is one piece of furniture. It's called the ark. This is the ark. Now, five years ago, very, very few people knew what you were talking about when you talked about the ark. They just didn't know. But today, a lot more people know what you're talking about because they went to see a movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark. See, but that's the same ark. That's what it's talking about, the same thing. This ark was in the most holy place. This is a chest-like affair. It's hollow. On top of it is a lid, and on top of that lid are two golden angels, cherubims. In between those two angels is the mercy seat of God or what was known as the Shekinah glory of God dwelt right there. If you were to pick the lid up off of that ark, inside it you would find three things. You'd find Aaron's rod that budded. You'd find a pot of manna and the Ten Commandments that God had written with his own finger on tables of stone. Those Ten Commandments are inside that ark because they are the very basis and foundation of God's government. And dear friends, they will always be throughout eternity. It will never change. Jesus said not one jot nor one tittle will ever pass from the law. It won't happen. It is the foundation of God's government. You see, when God created Adam... He needed four commandments. Do you know that? Now, when he created Adam, he needed four commandments because the first four commandments deal with a man's relationship to God. That's what the first four are all about. See, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's dealing with your relationship to God. Second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. That's dealing with your relationship to your maker, who you're worshiping. The third one says, Thou shalt not take his name in vain. And the fourth one said, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and it talks about how he made the world and all. So that first four commandments dealt with Adam's relationship to God. And if God had only created Adam and no one else, he wouldn't have needed but four. But when he created Eve, he had to add six more. Forgive me, but that's true to a sense. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference whether it was Eve or just another individual. The moment he created one more person, he had to add six more because those last six deal with your relationship to your fellow man. It's what it's about. It says, honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's all in relationship to your fellow man. That's what it's talking about. So he has those Ten Commandments. Those are placed on the inside of that ark. Okay. Top of the ark is the mercy seat. The priest, the high priest now, will take the blood and he will sprinkle that 
on the mercy seat confessing the sins of Israel. After he has confessed their sins, that high priest is going to turn and walk out of the most holy place, through the holy place, and he's going to walk back out into the court where there now is the scapegoat. Going to place his hands on the head of that scapegoat and he's going to confess the sins of Israel. Who does the scapegoat represent? Represents the devil, Satan. Then why would this priest place his hands on the head of the scapegoat and confess the sins of Israel? Did the devil bear our sins? Did he pay the debt for our sins? No. 10,000 times no. The devil never bore your sins. He didn't pay in your debt, and he never will. Then why place his hands on the head of that scapegoat and confess the sins of Israel? simply because the Lord Jesus Christ died for you. He died for me. He paid our debt, but he did not die for the devil. And the devil must bear his own. And since he is the father of it, he must bear his own sin, and he has a part in everybody's. And that's the reason that the hands were placed on the head of the scapegoat and their sins were confessed. Says that a devout man of Israel now takes that scapegoat out into the wilderness where it is turned loose to wander and to die. This was called the cleansing of the sanctuary, the day of atonement, or the day of judgment. Don't forget it for tomorrow night. It becomes very, very important that you know what it's talking about. Now, since we put some of that together, Let's see now if we can begin to apply some things that we've learned. In the book of Hebrews, it has this to say. You remember, let me just back up just a minute. You remember Jesus has died. He has been resurrected. He spent 40 days on the earth with his disciples, and now he is ascending, going back to heaven. Okay, you with me? He's gone back to heaven. When he went back to heaven, Paul in the book of Hebrews outlines it very clearly what happens. This is what he says. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. It says that when Jesus Christ went back to heaven, he went back to heaven as our high priest. You see, today, we don't have a priesthood except the priesthood of believers. You are each one a priest. Did you know that? Oh, the Bible makes that very clear. If you don't understand that, read the book of Revelation. It says when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ that he makes you a child of the king. He does better than that. He says he makes you kings and queens and priests. So we're all priests. But Jesus Christ is the high priest. He's the high priest. Now listen very clearly because it's going to tell us some of the things that he does. A minister of the sanctuary and of the, what? True tabernacle which the Lord set up and not man. Oh, it's not talking about the sanctuary on earth. You know what happened. You remember the sanctuary was here and then David decided he wanted to build the temple. You remember? And God told him he couldn't because he was a man of blood. And so he collected everything and his son Solomon put it together he had Solomon's temple. And then you remember it was destroyed. And after it was destroyed, later, Herod, well, I should say before Herod, you remember Zerubbabel and, Jer uh, and uh, who else? Ezra, Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, all those came back and they rebuilt the temple. You remember that? And then Herod came along and he refurbished it. And then it was destroyed in 70 A.D. When it says that there's a sanctuary which the Lord set up and not man, it's not talking about the one here on earth. 
not talking about that. It's talking about the one up in heaven that God set up. Man didn't set it up. The Lord set it up. It's up in heaven. But Christ having come as a high priest of the good things to come by the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not human hands didn't make it. The Lord made it. Special temple. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are a figure of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So it says clearly that Jesus is up in heaven tonight, dear friends, and he is your high priest ministering up there in your behalf. I don't know, did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ knows you by name? That's what the Bible says. It says he knows every one of you by name. It even says in the Scripture that he knows your address. Knows all of you. He knows all about you. That every hair of your head has been numbered. That he's concerned about you. He loves you. He is your high priest. I can go to him anytime. Talk to him. I can find forgiveness anytime. Right? Oh, learn it, dear friends. Heaven is open for business 24 hours a day. Go to him. I don't have to go to bed with a soiled record. I can go to bed every night clean. Let me tell you another secret. You write it down in your book. Five minutes of prayer in the morning will save a half hour of confession at night. So just spend some time with the Lord in the morning. It makes a great, great difference in your life. Great difference. Jesus is our high priest. Now, it says that this power would cast the sanctuary down. And what I'm trying to tell you, if you go back and you study church history, you'll find that that very power did everything it could to do away with the sanctuary. You see, because if you spend some time studying the sanctuary and you spend some time in the book of Hebrews, you're going to see the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ like you have never seen it before. You'll learn things about Christ and his mercy and his kindness and his love towards you, dear friend, that will thrill your soul. And the devil knows that. And he doesn't want you to understand anything about the sanctuary. It says that the daily sacrifice would be done away with. That's how people receive the forgiveness of their sins. I hear people being told all kinds of things. I hear people today being filled with a bunch of psychology that is absolutely anti-Christian. They have all kinds of things to offer you to find release for your guilt. And dear friend, let me tell you something. There is nothing like the blood of Jesus Christ. It says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Don't care what it is, you can be clean. I don't have to go around and carry any burden on my back. I don't have to be bound down with sin all the time. I can have release from that. All you got to do is go to him. And people today are being told all kinds of things rather than going to Jesus Christ and finding forgiveness and release from guilt. If you haven't had a spring in your step in a while, then, dear friend, you might try asking forgiveness. It certainly does it for you. And this is what it's talking about. In the last days, there'll be a... And this, by the way, this text here that Christ referred to in Matthew 24, 15 has to do with the second coming and he's saying in the last days there's going to be an effort made to help people forget how they receive forgiveness. That's what it's talking about. It says that the truth would be cast down. The truth of God's word. And I find people offered everything in the world other than a clear thus saith the Lord. It bothers me when I hear preachers 
stand in the pulpit and preach a whole sermon and don't even quote a word of Scripture. Now, dear friends, we need to come to God's Word. We need to see what it says. Know what the truth is. As I told you before, there's one thing you can depend on. You can depend on this book. It's the same as food to you, spiritually. You need to eat. You need to eat every day. For some of you that are starving to death spiritually, you need to eat. And as you do, you'll find it'll change many, many things. You see, the Bible simply speaks of Jesus Christ as our high priest, it talks about him as the sacrifice, the lamb. It refers to him as the good shepherd. A friend of mine was over in the Middle East, had one day left, decided he wanted to go out and climb one of the mountains, go out from Jerusalem. There's mountains out there. And so he decided he wanted to go out and climb one of those mountains. He hired him a guide. I can tell you those ravines are deep, it's treacherous, and you don't need to be out there by yourself. I don't care who you are. And so he hired him a guide, and they went out early in the morning while it was still dark because it was going to take them all day to climb the mountain. And they started up this mountain. He said they'd been climbing for long enough for daylight to have broke. The sun was coming up, and he said they were walking a very narrow path the mountain went up on the right-hand side and it dropped 150 foot straight off. So they were walking along there very, very carefully. As they were walking, they looked up ahead of them and over the top of the rise came a shepherd. Behind him filed his sheep, as they do in the Middle East. They don't go in front of the shepherd, they follow the shepherd following him single file down this path. His guide turned to him and said, we're going to have to get off the path. And so they crawled up on the side of the mountain and had a seat. And the shepherd came by and spoke to them in Arabic, continued on down the path, and the sheep continued to follow, one behind the other. Said they had been sitting there for about five minutes and the sheep were still coming over the rise. And he said, ten minutes passed and they were still coming over the rise. And 15 minutes passed, and they were still coming over the rise. He said, as he looked up there, over the rise came this old ewe. He said he could tell that she was sick, old. He said as she walked down that path, every step you could tell was labored. She staggered as she walked. said he watched her, and as she got right up front of where they were seated, he said evidently all the strength that she had gave way, and the old you just sank right there in the path. And as she did, she gave out a cry. He said the other sheep behind her stopped. And he said in just a moment he heard the shepherd down below shout. And that old you all of a sudden, with all the strength she had, she tried to get back to her feet, struggling as hard as she could just to get up to be able to go on. She was too weak. She couldn't make it. He said a few minutes passed, and again he heard that shepherd shout, and again he saw that old ewe struggle, try to muster all the strength that she had in her just to be able to get up and go on. She couldn't make it. He turned to his guide and he said, what's the shepherd saying? He said, oh, he's calling her by name. Watch now as the shepherd began to make his way back up the path. And as he's making his way up the path, he wondered what that shepherd would do. This old you was old. She was sick. The days of her usefulness were gone. Wondered if he would just pick her up and toss her out over the cliff, get rid of her. He said the shepherd came up there, stood over that ewe, looked at her, 
And then in a very quiet voice, he spoke her name. And again, the OU for the last time struggled for all she could. I mean, just putting everything that she could just to be able to get up and go on down the path. But she couldn't make it. He said the shepherd bent over and took those front two feet in one hand, the back two feet in the other hand, picked her up and tossed her out and up and around his neck, turned and headed down the path. He turned to the guide and he said, what'll happen? He said, oh, he'll take her home and he'll nurse her and care for her till she's well and she's strong again. Oh, dear friend, tonight, I just want to ask you if you're sin sick, then let me tell you, there's a good shepherd. He'll just take you in his arms and he'll love you and care for you and forgive you of your sins because he cares for us. He is the good shepherd. He loves each one of us in a very, very special way. Tonight, I want you to think about the love of Jesus Christ for you as Sylvia said. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we come to Thee weak, sick of heart and soul. But so thankful, Lord, that You're willing to take us, to forgive us of our sins, to make us well and strong again. Oh, we thank You for the Lord Jesus Christ for his love and his mercy and his goodness to each of us. Bless each one here tonight that they may know him who is our salvation. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Don't forget tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, our subject is the Book of Life on Judgment Day. We're going to be putting those three books up here on the screen. We're going to be putting names in them. We're going to see exactly how the judgment works so you don't want to miss tomorrow night. It's really an important night. Good night. God bless each one of you.